Hello! I might get started with just a couple people, um, just to, you know, be going, uh, get going, be doing stuff. I might need to take a couple of breaks during this one due to illness reasons, but that's just, that's just life really, isn't it? I'm just going to assume that my uh, audio and everything is all fine, because it normally is. This time I really did do some building off stream, by which I mean I went to um, popular shopkeeper, vor enthusiast and general liar about the nature of the universe, Kingseeker Frampt, and sold him all of the shit I was carrying around and didn't want, so um, good for him, he's got that now. So there's really only um, one path left for us to, to progress. We have to head off to New Londo. However, as a time-saving measure, I'm not going to head to New Londo right away. See, to fight the boss of New Londo, you need to go do some other stuff. Well, no, I tell her, fuck it, let's do, this the, <laughs> let's do this the way the developers intended. That's what I'm supposed to be committing to on these streams, so let's do that. There's no reason not to go through um, the dark root zones early, but um, doing so generally generally isn't necessary until this point. You can actually progress through it and take all of the bosses and everything until uh, early and then come back so that you don't have to come back later. That's what I normally do. However, this time we're going to head straight down this hole, which means that we will do this area, get to the end of this area, then meet a guy who's like, oh, um... Do you have a license? Do you have a license for this dark hole in the ground? I'm sorry, you can't go in without a license. Then we'll go get a license from somewhere else. Which is a very poetic way of... It's not poetic, but it's it's a very uh, unreal way of saying, actually, we'll go do something else. So New Londo is an interesting area because it's one of the places that actually presents us with the... Uh, the human cost of the various horrible existential sins that go on in the in this world. We've been down here before just to talk to a guy, but I'll have a bit more of a look. I love this guy. He's the only chill hollow in the entire game. Look at him. Look at that view. I can I can empathize with this guy very strongly. <laughs> Charmer ahead. Yeah, I mean sure. I don't think uh does he have Well, it's useless to me, but it looks valuable. I'm really wanting to handle it anyway. Yes, as you should. I won't disappoint you. I'm past waiting that long. So, giving him the uh, magic ember is usually a good idea. It lets you. Well, I mean, it's literally the only use the item has, and it will allow him to create. Uh, the second level of the of the magic scaling items, which is enchanted rather than magic. So if we get an item of the right level and transpose it with this, it will become enchanted and it will scale very well with our, our intelligence stat, but retain also some of the physical stat scaling that we have. However, since we are using the uh, Velka's Rapier and probably will just be using that, there it's just not really a thing. We might come back later and enchant something else to use, which is always an option, but uh, I like to spread my, my enchantments around in different damage types. The Estoc, and Estoc is like a rapier, but extremely large and oversized. Oh shit, hi, what's up? Hi guy. Bye, guy. Well, that's all for him, I guess. So I completely forgot that that happens here, but that's actually the Crestfallen Knight. At a certain point when we return to, um, at a certain point when we return to Firelink Shrine, he has disappeared, and where he where he has gone is down here. Uh, it turns out he's gone hollow, and um, he attacks you down here the way that hollows do. It's kind of a kind of a weird situation, really. It's uh, certainly an issue, but um, normally he's just a, an easy fight, you know, because he's not very tough by this level of the, by this stage of the game. But <laughs> I've never seen him backstep straight off the cliff to his death before, so sucks to be him, I guess. 
Anyway, the items that we just picked up are transient curses, which actually I think are really interesting. So let's have a quick look at the item description. I've mostly been skipping item descriptions on this playthrough, but... Limb of a victim of a curse. Temporary curse allows engagement with ghosts. The only way to fight back against ghosts who are cursed beings is to become cursed oneself. The safest method, however dreadful, is to cut off an arm of the dead. So I like that this is an item, but what it really represents is... Um, also, I have no idea. I can't remember what I say moments after I say it. What it represents is a kind of a transgression, a kind of, um, you know, a thing that should not be done. You should not interfere with the dead. You should not desecrate a corpse. Therefore, by desecrating a corpse, you bring a curse upon your, upon your head. Because what is a curse? It's a kind of a cosmic punishment for an existential sin, which is a phrase I am really getting a lot of use out of. So, if that's the case and you need to be cursed to fight a ghost, why not give yourself a very weak curse by sort of vaguely insulting the dead by cutting bits off their corpses? Ghosts are extremely difficult to fight if you don't- if you aren't cursed, if you don't have the transient curse, but um, there's plenty of them lying around this area and I've just goddamn realized I'm not human, so I'll just- I will uh, zoom way back up to Firelink Shrine real quick and then jump back down here super fast. Being human will boost my item drop chance, which means that these guys will be more likely to drop transient curses, which will be very useful for progressing through the area. Um, you only start with a couple of them. You can buy some from, I think, the, uh, the undead merchant, the moss lady, but hiya. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm sure you're all uh, enjoying meeting one another. Incidentally, that reminds me, I'm intending to set up a Discord server at some point. Not to be like a community thing, at least not at the start, but to be a um, just an easy way to ping people when it's time to play games. Because at the moment, I'm pinging like 10 friends off my friends list, being like, hey, I'm streaming. And um, honestly, copy-pasting that message is just irritating. Sorry for anyone who thought you were getting bespoke messages. Ahoy, ahoy, ahoy. Anyway, back to what I was saying, which is that, so the transient curse is a really interesting item to me, and it, um, it gives us a little window into what curses are. Because a curse kind of can be anything based on, you know, the fiction. The same way a demon kind of can mean almost anything. Your day is ruined. What do you now know that's ruined your day? Or is it just me talking about curses? Oh, of course, the pings, right. Ah, see, this is what I say. Thanks to ADHD, I just forget what I say the second that I say it. Which is one of the reasons why my Let's Plays are so full of tangents and distractions and forgetting what the fuck I was talking about. But yeah, so in in a different fantasy story, demon, like everyone kind of knows what a dragon is. There's idea, you know, there's a consistent idea for what a dragon is or a griffin or something. But a demon can be all kinds of different things. Is it literally a spirit from hell? Is it any kind of spirit? Is it any kind of monster regardless of the source of it? There's all these different ways of um, depicting these things. I'm not sure how long the transient... Oh, it's already more... Okay, it might have stopped when I rested at the bonfire, so that's less than ideal. The little white sparkles around me currently, if you can see them, are the indication that I have the uh, the buff, or more accurately, debuff, of uh, Transient Curse. But it can be quite hard to spot, so it's easy to not realise that your curse has ended and then get attacked by something. Also, secret item on here, but... This is the real nasty trick they pull. Because ghosts are intangible, uh, they can actually walk through walls, which means that the devs have placed them fucking everywhere. They are below the path, above the path, inside walls, underneath walls, all over the place. Which means that if you aren't careful, they can ambush you very easily. So this is often considered one of the harder zones to play through as a new player of the game, but one of the easier zones to play through if you know what you're doing. Because if you just remember where all the ghosts are, they can't ambush you, and if you can't be ambushed, they have a harder time killing you. This is also true in real life. Um, if you ever find yourself at risk of ambush, just simply learn where they are beforehand. It's also worth keeping an eye on the edges here. This entire area is sunken beneath the waves, for reasons we'll go into later. But um, 
we will be needing to uh, try and save as many as possible so that we can come back down later. In fact, I think we can spot a couple over there. Can't quite see them right now, but they're, def they're definitely around. Anyway, I think this is technically a debuff. Thematically, within the game world, it's a debuff. You've brought a mild curse on yourself, but I don't think it actually has any in-game negative repercussions. All it does is let you interact with ghosts. If you don't wear a transient curse, you cannot um, hit them with spells, you can't hit them with weapons, they're just completely intangible and it passes through. And, um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, the, the word demon in the English language has meant so many different things and can mean so many different things to different people at different times. So, it's interesting when you have something like Dark Souls, which establishes pretty consistently that a demon is something that has sprung forth from the bed of chaos. Any, any monster that it exists because of that is a demon. Similarly, curses can mean basically anything. A curse is a kind of magic spell, that's what you know. Um, ouch. In, you know, every kind of fantasy story, that's what curse means. But whether that's something naturally occurring that one might bring upon themselves, which is very often what it means in mythology, transgressing against the natural order, you know, breaking rules of hospitality, breaking the laws of your god, whatever else, brings some kind of curse upon you. Um, but it, you know, it might be something that's specifically cast by a spellcaster, it might be the name of a kind of magic, it might be the name of a way of using magic. Kinslaying is a very classic way of getting cursed, yeah. And, um, so given that, it's nice that there are these hints about what exactly curse means in Dark Souls. And I believe that it means this kind of, like, transgression against the natural order. One of the major themes of Dark Souls is transgressing against the natural order, resulting in everything getting fucked up for everyone. The reason why the world is in a shit state is because uh, Gwyn has transgressed against the natural order by trying to prolong the Age of Fire longer than the natural lifespan of the universe. I knew that guy was there, I just decided to take the hit. Um, Speedrun strats. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so it's just nice to know that it's it's kind of the impl implicit that there's many hundreds of ways to get cursed and you might very easily bring a curse upon yourself by transgressing against some some natural law. And, um, oh, hi. Didn't see you there. We good? It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's, we're, we're cool. It's all good. You know, this place is kind of a ghost town. So this is actually a banshee. Everything we've been fighting up until now is a is a ghost, technically, and then these I think these ones are banshees. If you get too close to them, they scream, which doesn't hurt, but it's just a kind of a unfortunate noise. As you can see, they're holding some kind of ghost baby. They're more powerful than the ordinary ghosts, which perhaps means that uh, the curse brought about by the end of a young mother is perhaps stronger in some way than... Uh, yeah, see, that's that's interesting. Like, the curse of the basilisks is the same as the curse of uh, things that curse you. In Oh, that's a pain in the ass. So the one I shot up there has dropped something, but since it's on top of this gazebo, I can't... That's not a gazebo, it's a colonnade. My dad would be having fits. He's an architect, just to explain that joke. But, um... Yeah, what I like to believe is that if... if, if um, you know, the metaphysical laws of the world are consistent and constant, and cursing is a part of those metaphysical laws, some creature somewhere has evolved to use it. If uh, if creatures have evolved to breathe fire or have acidic poisons or whatever, then perhaps they have also evolved to take advantage of some kind of curse. See, these guys are waiting to ambush me, but I'm smarter than them. Oh, it looks like my curse has worn off since I'm not hurting him. Do I not have... I thought I put them on my toolbar. I guess I didn't. So yeah, um, there's a lot of different curses in Dark Souls. And since we do know now that Dark Souls 3 and Dark Souls 1 are canonically in the same, same setting, and I guess Dark Souls 2 as well, although to a lesser extent, then um, I have forgotten what I was going to say. Interestingly, you don't have to be cursed via the uh, transient curses. If you are cursed by dying to, uh, you know, 
Steeth's crystal magic or curse build up from basilisks, then uh, even though you have your, your health halved, you can actually progress through this zone fighting the, the ghosts easily. Additionally, um, if you are wielding a cursed weapon, of which there are, I think there are only three in the game, then you can fight them. But fighting them with a cursed weapon is harder than fighting them but with transient curses or even just by being cursed yourself because only the weapon can interact with them. They can hit right through your shield with no trouble um, and you can't body block them in any way. So it's interesting that the... It's, it's really endearing that uh, the designers of this game are careful enough that they maintain that dis difference. And um, specifically... Those weapons are the, uh, I think it's the Cursed Knight Greatsword it's called, which we will be getting a bit later on. Well, we won't be getting it, but we can get it a bit later on. Which is, I believe, made from the soul of Great Wolf's, Great Wolf's Sif. The other option is uh, the knives that these guys themselves drop. Also, their arms stretch out to do their attacks, which is why they're kind of a pain to fight. They have a couple of melee attacks, and they also have a grab attack, which is devastating. If they get the grab, that is generally curtains for you. There's two or three of them that live in that little rondle over there. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting theory. This bit's a little bit uh, difficult, a little bit tense, because there's three or four that live in that place over there. But there's also about 10 of them that live in the house to my right, which means that uh, I have to try and aggro them a few at a time to take care of them. The idea of a ritually unclean substance being, um, what is the word for, um, the way an ecosystem sort of collects toxic substances, the way that mercury will be eaten in tiny amounts by by plankton and then larger amounts by the fish that eat the plankton and then larger and larger amounts by the fish that eat the fish or, until you get seabirds that are poisonous to eat at all because they've collected all of the mercury up, up the food chain. Bioaccumulation, yeah, that's exactly the word I was looking for. I love the idea I love the idea of a of a ritually unclean bioaccumulation. And it's itself kind of makes sense because the first place we encounter the basilisks is in oh no you don't is in the uh, the deep dark underground sewer system. If anything was ever ritually unclean, it is a sewer that is literally cursed by the nature of how much of a goddamn sewer it is. <laughs> yeah, mushroom curse is a good idea. Um, oh, I'm having the most intense deja vu of streaming while running through this zone, even though I never ever have before. Fortunately, fortunately, it is the nature of the dead to be impatient. So these ambushes are relatively easier to preemptively trigger. I think one of them's stuck in this wall. The other place they hang out is in uh, the hollow tree that leads to Ash Lake and in Ash Lake itself, which again kind of might imply some connection to transgression because of course those areas are... Um... Oh, that's the... yeah. Oh, that did way less damage than, than I remember it doing, huh? There's something really funny about this very slow menacing attack as they as they draw a knife across your throat and then it doesn't even hurt you. It's very clear that my character never ever skips neck day. But yeah, so the connection between Ash Lake and uh, the primordial former world in, in a prior existence might itself um, perhaps represent some kind of connection to that transgression. Hey Lisa, welcome to the channel. We're talking about uh, curses. I'm not going to try and make some kind of... Um, comparison to inter intergenerational trauma, but I think if someone wanted to, they could. There's a few things here I'm going to grab before we uh, go meet the guy who's going to tell us to fuck off and come back later. 
but that guy will do so and we will meet him in a minute. There's a fair bit more to explore here. After a little bit, we will be opening up a, uh, a big a big thing and uh, that will drain the water and then we can go to the lower zone. Now, if I remember correctly, this is the other end of the Valley of Drakes. We've been up the first end of the Valley of Drakes. It's, it's almost like a second Firelink Shrine. It's this sort of hub location you pass through on your way to other places. So that over there has a lift inside it that goes up to Darkroot Basin, where we, where we, I think, unlocked the lift earlier. There's also a lift in this area that goes down here, and then over there, on top of that, somewhere, I'm pretty sure it's at the top of that tower, is the uh, Red Tearstone Ring, which is very useful for speedrun strats, which I don't think I did pick up yet. Nope. Yeah, especially considering the way that vampires are very often used as metaphors for things like intergenerational trauma as well, or disease, or um, unspeakability and so on. Anyway, that's what we need to go find the key for, and the guy who has the key won't give it to us until we prove that we can survive in the abyss, which uh, I will talk about a bit later, if I remember, which I probably won't. So this is very obviously a trap. We're about to get attacked by another ghost. He's hiding in this uh, conspicuous pillar. Like a conspicuous pillock. Is there not a guy here? I'm sure there's a guy here. Where the fuck's my ghost? <laughs> Where is it? Where's my ghost? So I'm going to take a bit of a risky jump now just to get some more secret, well, secretive items. From the uh, fireplace of the inside of this, of this house, this, well, it's not really a house, it's more like a church. You can actually get up on the roof. In fact, from here in the roof, you can see through here, there's the there's the room we were in earlier with the fireplace, where you can mostly see my face, but still. I feel like ghosts being able to choose if they can interact with humans or living things or physical objects, but um, humans not being able to make that choice about the ghosts is very common though. That's a very sort of horror movie poltergeisty thing to do. Ghosts in horror movies can move stuff around, but they can also be not touched if they don't want to be. I think there's a I think there's a there's a way down from up here, but <laughs> oh here we go. There we go. So I think we've grabbed everything in this area that there is to grab. There's one or two items that I've skipped because they can't be reached from here. They have to wait until we have drained the swamp from below. Well no, it's not the swamp, it's the uh, the water. I remember you telling me that previously. I do find that really endearing as a folk belief. Yeah, and then that can tie back around to intergenerational trauma when you consider that the touching ghosts tend to do in stories is to um, fuck up the living. What's this? Not a ghost? What's not a ghost doing up here? Oh, I love that. There's something really interesting in games about the way that um, generic AI behaviours can be used to give a sense of character accidentally. There's an interesting... There's something really interesting about that. So as I get closer, he turns to face me. That's kind of unnerving, right? There's, the, there's that horror movie moment of, of the person you think you're sneaking up on turns around and looks at you. But that's just a generic AI behavior. The AI turns to look at you wherever you're going. So the fact that he's placed over here takes advantage of that pre-existing default behavior. <clears throat> the four keys slumber in the deepest chamber of the ruins. Use this key to break the seal and open the floodgates. Oh, and do not forget, the dark wraiths reside in a dark void called the Abyss. But the Abyss is no place for ordinary mortals. Although, long ago, the Knight Artorius traversed the Abyss. If you can find him and learn from him, the abyss may prove surmountable. 
So this guy actually has a lot of information on this place and what happened here. He can break curses on you, which is really useful because if you don't have any purging stones and you can't buy any more purging stones, you can't remove the curse debuff provided by the curse uh, st stat buildup. He also sells transient curses, which is useful, and sells the resist curse sorcery. Which we will never actually need, but I will buy for the sake of completionism. So, what do we need to do now? We need to go find Artorius, because if we don't, then when we go fight the boss of this area, we will uh, die instantaneously. I'm not sure, actually. It could be. He does sound quite similar. I could see uh, I could see him being the same guy who plays uh, the Pyromancer trainer in Dark Souls 3 as well. But yeah, so the Abyss is really interesting in Dark Souls because it's never really gone into what it is or what it does. Um, and it appears differently in, in every time it shows up. In Dark Souls 1 and in the DLC to Dark Souls 1, it's different between those two different uh, presentations. Oh. Uh-oh. I was going to say it couldn't get the best of me, but it <laughs> absolutely can. There's no point even using your shield against a ghost because, as I said, it will just go straight through. So, um, god, what was I saying? So, uh, yeah. New Londo continues this trend of, um, people disturbing things they shouldn't and doing stuff they shouldn't and bringing about terrible, terrible eventualities by their, their hubris. And, uh, New Londo is another example. The Four Kings used the Shard of the Lord Soul bequeathed to them by Gwyn in order to make a great civilization, and then that civilization fell into corruption and despair and uh, collapsed into, into this mess that we see before us. Which also resulted in the releasing of the void, and uh, in order to contain the void and prevent humanity from being destroyed, they flooded it. And so you hear about this all the way through, and you might even have found the other side of this giant doorway. But upon actually opening it, we actually see the human cost of that, which is kind of unusual for games. I don't think games shy away from vast mounds of corpses, but it's usually kind of an active thing. There's less kind of an association of, of ancient sin. So, uh, if we go, we have to go outside and then back around to kind of, um, oh, I guess we can just activate this now. I guess it's locked by the same mechanism, huh? I don't think I did that the last time I played through this zone, I just went around like an idiot. Fortunately, there's no ghosts down here, however, occasionally the ghosts from the upper city will path down here if you get too close to them. Anyway, we're not actually going to go fight that boss just yet because we have to go fight uh we have to go get the bond of Arturius in order to be able to go through the abyss but before we do that we're just going to fight this one dark wraith for funsies a lot of people find these guys difficult to fight which is funny all things considered they're a good way to farm titanite chunks as well which is nice Let's see how much damage i can do to these oh they're pretty tough okay so there's a shit ton of these drakes outside which we'll need to fight uh, to get back to where we're going. So I guess I'll just ramble about Londo while I do this. Oh, that's not fair. You shouldn't dodge my attacks. What the fuck? That's against the rules. I only get a few of these. Soul spears do not grow on trees, young man.
So these guys can be pretty tough because they keep flying overhead and generally have a very active moveset, but they also do a shit ton of damage in electricity, or lightning I guess, which is a damage type that is quite hard to get resistances to. Anyway, so um, in order to in order to seal off New Londo and the, the threat of the Abyss and the people who entered into it and became part of it, the, uh, the Dark Wraiths, the entire city was flooded. And uh, that guy who sent us down here was in fact one of the three sorcerers who were sent to ensure that the drowning of the city happened without a hitch. The three, cha the three channelers of New Londo. One of whom has disappeared and uh, nobody knows what happened. One of whom went to Blight Town and whose corpse and uh, pyromancies and sorceries we found. Which is interesting itself that um, she went there. Apparently the channelers were sorcerers who specialised in... Uh, effective healing sorceries, which is interesting because heal sorceries, as we learn them, sorceries of the Dragon School, have no capacity to heal. So that's an interesting sort of set of facts to be going along with. It's implied, as I said at the time when we found it, that that particular channeler decided to turn into a giant horrible polyp. Which is, I mean, we can all empathise with the desire to turn into a giant horrible polyp occasionally. Um, but, like, you know, she had responsibilities. And so that guy is the last remaining channeler of New Londo. The one who's actually stayed here to perform his, uh, his cosmic purpose. Which is, of course, to provide whatever the uh, Chosen Undead needs in order to go do the thing the Chosen Undead is supposed to do. So it's interesting how even the in these, like subtle aspects people are um aligned or not aligned with the gods of Anor Londo or um certain other places so this is the exit of the lift we found ages ago when we briefly went through dark root i'm not going to use it right now although i think it's accessible from both ends already but let's just um let's just send it up just so that we make sure it's unlocked Um, huh, that's interesting. Is that a misplaced texture or is it just... I uh, don't suppose it matters. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, New Londo. Where the abyss, abyss is, is kind of interesting. It's connected to the dark quite uh, definitely and strongly. But what that connection is, is, is curious. Because there is no kind of greater realm that is connected to the light. One might say that Anor Londo is such a realm, but Anor Londo was clearly, you know, built by the gods and is the dwelling place of the gods. The Abyss is the dwelling place of, no place of nothing. It's emptiness. It's total, total absence of, of anything. But despite being that, it's not the same thing as stasis, which is interesting. I know I say this is interesting quite a lot, but it is. Surely the total stasis of the void, would is that, is that not me meaningfully the same as... The stasis from before existence, before disparity showed up? I don't have an answer to that question, personally. Especially considering what the Void is, is, is very variable and inconsistent. It's presented in the base game as being a Void. It's just blackness forever. No, no floor, no ground, no up, no down, just nothing forever. However, uh, it's also implied that creatures dwell within the Abyss, some kind of, um, you know, horrible cosmic beyond entities. And it's also directly shown later in a much more classically video gamey, slimy kind of way, let's say. Because in the DLC to this game, uh, you can go back in time and meet Artorius before he went, to, well, actually, no, after he went to the, the Abyss and uh, find out what happened to that guy and what his whole deal is and learn a, a bunch of stuff about the Knights of Gwyn. When you do that, um, the abyss that he went to is kind of um, a growing, in, encroaching thing, which implicitly is the same as what was happening in New Londo. However, in New Londo, there's a very distinct border where you eventually find a place that sort of spirals down into nothingness and you work your way down and there's just... Eventually you reach a point where you, you run out of, you know, physical things to look at and interact with. Let's just get this done while we're here. 
And um, but the void as presented in Ulusil is 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 very <laughs> honestly it's sticky. I don't know if you've ever been to the void and it's sticky, but um, it is. Nobody likes a sticky void. I'm not actually sure what the shortest way to get where we're going is. Probably, oh, hey, Petrus. By the way, I met those people you led to their deaths. How do you feel about that? Ah. Oh, you. Have you seen the lady? Oh, blast. Where might she be? And would she be safe? Well, shit, bro. I know exactly where she is. Oh, I'm sorry. Miracles, was it? Sometimes I lose... I'm not sure he ever, um, acknowledges what's up. But um, we did actually, we did actually rescue uh, the the maiden he brought to this place, and the and killed the two knights that she brought, who went hollow and turned on her. Uh, that would have been last stream. So, having rescued her from there, she actually moves to the uh, undead parish. So we should actually be able to go meet her since we're in the area. Why not do that? You know, we can fit in some side quests. We can we can wander around and talk to NPCs. We don't have to just go objective, objective, objective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go rest at the right bonfire and then I'll go talk to her and then we can... Uh, and then I can teleport back to the bonfire and that will be a nice shortcut. But yeah, so... Um, the void goes from being very clean and, and smooth and becomes this, as you say, gaping sticky hole. Which is, uh, it has a physicality to it. The void itself has a physicality, and it's presented as this sticky purple slime. And it infects people and changes them, and everybody turns into 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 weird pumpkin-headed scarecrow monsters. Which I like a lot less, personally. I like a, I like a nice classy void. But, um... Yeah, and then when the void shows up again in other games, it's it's kind of strange and different. A lot of people make a connection between uh, the deep from Dark Souls Three and the void, which is understandable, but um, I don't think there's a connection personally. The deep seems to be connected to the ocean in some way, and and is themed around the color blue, whereas the void is themed around the color black and is tied to the absence of everything. Which again is just kind of weird when you consider the. Um, the way that, uh, you know, everything is kind of tied to nothing. That was a sentence that didn't make sense, but I don't care. That is not the correct direction. Parry this, you casual. The deep was also quite sticky and slimy, but I do think it had uh, a different aesthetic. Oh, hey, I missed this item when I came through here. Not that we'll ever use it, but gotta to, got to maintain that kleptomaniac perfect streak. I could fight these guys properly, but instead I'm just gonna explode them all. Or perhaps not that guy. I think there's one at the top of the stairs, but I'm just gonna leave him alive to tell tales of my magnificence. I've slain all of your brethren. Go, warn the others about me. Now that I think about it, did we did I did I kill the guy? Did I Uh did I did I <laughs> There's a uh, there's a black knight at the top of this tower. I might have skipped him when we came through here. I think I hear black knight footsteps. Yeah, there he is. Hi. Boo. <laughs> Get absolutely wrecked. <laughs> And that's the way the cookie crumbles, by which I mean that's the way the man gets blasted into atoms. Yeah, exactly. I've been training since Tuesday, since that was when I first actually started being a wizard. So that's the the dragon that causes problems. Uh, Drake, technically, that causes us problems at the start of this uh, this game. You can fight him properly, or you can shoot him with an arrow, and he'll run away. Which sounds like that's not what he's doing. He might be on the thing. Uh, usually, once you get him to leave, you can you can unlock this pretty easily. But um, I'm gonna have to take a bit of a detour. You might remember this area as being a bit more difficult last time we came through. 
But yeah, that's one place you can shoot at him, and the other place you can shoot at him is, ouch, from under this bridge. So if you shoot from under this bridge, you can hit his tail enough that it comes off, which is how you get access, <laughs> which is how you obtain the uh, dragon tail sword, I believe it's called, which is uh, one of the first like noob weapons. And there's a couple of weapons in the game that let you beat the game really easily. Or at least let you get through the first half of the game really easily, and uh, that's one of them. So I, what I actually want to do is bait him to come down here and fight me like a... I was going to say man, but I guess enormous fire-breathing beast. Since we can just absolutely wreck him with our, our mighty magical prowess. If you are fighting a dragon, always have a nice safe hole to hide in. Or failing that, have decent fire resistance, which seems to be working. The reason why this guy, to fight properly, you want to come back and do later in the game is exactly that. We now have enough hit points that this endless spam can't really kill us. Heh, <laughs> yeah. So if I can get sight on him and actually blast the fucker, we can kill him pretty quickly. As you can see, that's about a third of his hit points off in one hit. It would have been really convenient if he had uh, killed the rest of these hollows, but you can't have everything, I guess. I suppose it's good to go uh, tie up this loose end now rather than later. Could you blow fire the other way, please? You can hide behind that short wall, which would be ideal, but... I definitely should have put my Ring of Fire resistance on. I think we should be safe here, and then if he can just get a little bit closer, I can explode him. There we go. And that's how you slay a dragon. None of this illogical, you know, right-handed golden spear nonsense. It is absolutely a question of arcane might. Wait, I'm your fave streamer now? That's remarkable. I thought I was, like, in top three, but I'm very pleased to hear that. So it's actually possible to come through here when you first come through this area, and um, if you bait the dragon into coming down to stomp on you by, by shooting him with arrows and then hiding behind the wall, then you can sp sprint between his legs, get in here, and then activate the bonfire and activate this shortcut. I did not do that because I couldn't get it to go down because it's kind of RNG whether or not it actually will. Now the next time we come back here, uh, that maiden should be here, hopefully. <laughs> Try beanpole. Uh, sure. Beanpole usually means tall. I'm not sure why they're suggesting we'd be tall to go through a tiny door. But um, this is one of the things that intrigues me in Dark Souls. There's just a tiny door. Why is there a tiny door? I don't know. Nobody knows. There will never be an answer to that question. This is the uh, Sunlight Warrior Covenant spot. You have to meet, if I remember correctly, you have to meet Solaire here at a very specific point in the narrative um, in order to unlock it and be able to use it. But um, the implication is that this is a statue of uh, the unnamed, long lost, disavowed eldest son of Gwyn, that warrior god who was cast down for some kind of unnamed transgression. I mean, yeah, that is about that is about appropriate height for for uh, for your apartment. Um, so yeah, this statue reoccurs throughout these games, getting losing more and more pieces as you go along. But the implication is that it was destroyed along with all other representations of him, and that his followers have managed to preserve at least parts of this one shrine. Anyway, I've just realised I rested at this bonfire, and I shouldn't have done. Let's jump to the undead parish. Where the hell is the Is this Undead Parish? Oh god, I can't even remember. This might- no, wait, hang on, you never see your own bonfire. Also, note that's that statue reoccurring again. Oh, that's cool. I haven't played any of the Pathfinder 
um, Infinity Engine style RPGs because I heard the first one was a bit bad. And um, after playing uh, Planescape Torment and then also playing um, the other one that I really liked, I kind of just decided not to. I mean, I've got Pillars of Eternity and Torment Tides of Numenera to play through, so before I do those, I kind of don't want to get any other Infinity Engine style RPGs. Do I even have anything I can upgrade right now? May as well cap this one off. I think plus five is the maximum for unique weapons. Uh, oh, we've got two spider shields. And we've bought the thing we need to buy, so that's fine. So long, Andre. Always nice to see you. Continue enjoying yourself. Also, this is kind of amusing. Andre has one very muscular arm and one less muscular arm. This is normal for a blacksmith, but his arms are the wrong way round. The arm he's hammering with should be the big, uh, oversized one, and the other arm should be the, uh, the weaker one. Anyway, I'm sure I was talking about something important a while back, but I don't for the life of me remember what it was. So, we are going to go find the first actually findable of the night. That's not true. Ornstein was one of the Knights of Gwyn. We fought him already. So, Ornstein was the boss in Anor Londo, and, um... He's referred to as being one of the four Knights of Gwyn. The others are, um, I believe, Kieran, who's some kind of assassin -y type. Gao, who, is a, who, who led uh, Gwyn's archers. And Artorius, who is kind of the noblest noble knight in existence. We don't know anything about Artorius beyond that he's kind of noble and is some kind of knight and is presumably of the people of the gods from whom the gods stock themselves is uh, is drawn, and presumably who were the original Silver Knights before the illusory Silver Knights were created. So we're not actually going to go through here just yet, but it's really convenient to open this shortcut now and come back to it later. This, uh, this, this can only be opened from this side and only if you buy the Crest of Artorias from Andre. It gives us a straight line across this forest to um, to the boss we'll be going and fighting. However, it's not my favourite route for taking through the area. So this bonfire will be therefore be quite handy later. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is loop back around to the... Uh, original area of Dark Root Basin that we went through ages ago, and uh, then we're going to fight a Hydra, which can be a pain in the ass. Fighting a Hydra is one way to get ahead, if you will, but um, you can come fight this boss at any time. It is technically an optional boss, you don't have to come through this area, and I think it's technically a, minim uh, a mini boss rather than a, a full boss, because it doesn't have a... Uh, a named boss health bar, it just has a monster's health bar. But it is enormous, it is the size of a small castle and we are going to stab it until it dies or possibly explode it with our brain. That was risky, but we don't care. We've reached the point at which um, we're just gonna, wizard's gonna wizard, so <laughs> we no longer have to worry about such things as gravity. Especially since we have the right of kindling now, which means we can upgrade bonfires even further than we have already. Did I fight Havel? I think I fought Havel. That door's open, which says yes to me. Yeah, he's gone, so. Dark Souls actually has pretty, uh, pretty strict fall distances. It's quite easy to die from falling. It feels like an appropriate amount of falling damage, generally. To me, at any rate, as someone who falls down a lot. So we don't need to fight these uh, golems. And what their deal is and why they're here is anyone's guess, really. Presumably, if Seath was keeping, tra uh, keeping track of this area, there would be a channeler around, but there isn't. However, we do know that these crystal golems were created by Seath. 
Perhaps they've escaped from his uh, laboratory. By which I mean his crystalline hole in the ground that he likes to live in. Or did like to live in before we broke in and murdered him, I guess. My favourite story about fall damage is in, vi in video games is uh, about World of Warcraft. When the second expansion, Wrath of the Lich King, came out, um, it introduced a new class. One of the abilities that class had was that it could walk on water, but unlike priests, it didn't just walk on water when they cast the spell. They had an AoE around them that turned the water to ice, which meant that anyone close to them could walk on the, <laughs> could walk on the ice. Which meant that for a few months after that class was released, everybody would spec into that class. Every, uh, everyone would take that class and take the spec that let them get that spell, rather. Which would then allow them to... Um, go into certain certain dungeons in the game with their team and uh, drop off a cliff first into a huge pond, then cast the spell, then hop up onto the, on top of the water, which means that all of the other members of their team dropping down behind them would land on the ice and die instantaneously from fall damage. It was really, really funny and it was my favourite thing to do in the game. <laughs> I don't troll much in video games, but I really had a lot of fun with that. So, whenever it takes a hit that will do enough damage to break a break a head, um, at one head breaks off. I think it's possible to kill it without breaking off all the heads, though. But the trick to fighting it is to get into the range where you can uh, blast away with soul spears. Or with a giant axe, if you happen to have a giant axe. But it's easier to hit him with uh, without locking on, since his body is way too far away and there's no lock-on spot for the, the heads. I'm not sure that um, Crystal Soul Mass is even triggered by it. Should take one more hit to deal with him, I think. Oh no, he's dead. That thing's body is actually a lot bigger than it looks. Um, it's actually, like, twice again as big, but under the water or stretching back into the wall. It's absolutely enormous. And there is actually another one in the game, which we will go and find a bit later. Where the hell is the ring I'm looking for? Here it is. I should have thought to put that ring on before taking this fight, and normally I do. But you can't have everything, and the ability to walk through water without stumbling is definitely part of everything. Now, at some point, we'll have to come back here to open up the DLC, which has a lot of irritatingly complicated steps. I'm just going to check to see if we've fulfilled the parameters already, but I don't think we have. After hitting a certain point in the main narrative, you can go to the Duke's Archive. And the first Crystal Golem in the Duke's Archive drops an item called... The mysterious amulet or something. If you have the mysterious amulet in your inventory, when you come to this cave behind the hydra, it's uh, there's a, a golden golem there, and if you break the golden golem open, it drops a princess, which is unusual loot, I think you'll agree. If you talk to her, uh, you can summon her out of time, and she's like, wow, time is weird, isn't it? I'm from 300 years in the past. And then... Um, you can interact with a weird thing which will teleport you to the past and then you go fight uh, the scattered remnants of an ancient deity and, you know, it's it's stuff. It's it's video games. It's, it's RPG shenaniganery. But this is the free entrance to Dark Root. This is how you do it if you don't want to pay 20,000 for that thing that I paid 20,000 for. But it's also slightly easier to access the, the two different areas from over here, I believe. What do you- I have no idea what you mean. Oh, right. I get what you mean. D I thought it just stopped- I thought it just went away. The spell doesn't last very long. Um, it didn't make the bzzzt noise it normally makes when, this, when the spell is ended prematurely by bumping into something. Well, one of them did. Then the rest of them disappeared. I thought you were talking about the rest of them. 
So there's two paths here. There's one that goes across this way, and there's one that goes up this way. Let's go up this way first, because I cannot remember which of these is better to explore first. It's okay, there will be more glowy orbs. So we're going to have to fight a shit ton of angry trees in this area. Well, angry bushes. Angry shrubs. Um, which is no longer a problem, since we can just easily destroy them. I could blast them with spells, but um, when they die that easily, it's kind of a waste. Not that it's possible to waste something renewable, but, you know, I always like to have a bit of spare just in case I get invaded by a player. So from here, I think, or from somewhere around here, I think we can see uh, where we fight the Moonlight Butterfly. But not this position, it must be somewhere else. Might be that over there in the background. There's a few things to grab here, but they're scattered over a pretty wide geographical area. Also, this is a nasty trick. The high elevation here hides this divot from you, so if you just sprint forwards, it's quite easy to run over the edge and uh, die horribly. Alright, well, if it's three against one, I will happily cast spells, you know. Anything to even the odds. So, I was talking about the Knights of Gwyn. Um, exactly how the world worked in the Golden Age when the gods walked amongst mankind is a bit of a mystery. Hmm, is that...? It's hard to tell. That's the Undead Parish. Up there, I think. And that's the bridge we cross that has the dragon on it. Yes. Which would mean that's Andre's Tower over there, which means that uh, Sen's Fortress is just around this corner. And yeah, that's that's the that's the the edge over there where that bright spot is, where we can get out of the bottom of uh, Andre's tower and enter into the Darkroot Basin zone. I think I think I have that position incorrect. It's reasonable to assume that these places were once more physically connected, and that the contraction of the universe that is the result of the sort of cosmic unspooling that's going on um, has resulted in these places getting all all fucked up and. With their elevations altered, and their sizes altered, and their layouts altered, and their histories altered. Just a whole lot of altering happening. Alright, you can fuck right off as well. In this house, we do not rehabilitate the bushes. I think I hear- oh, yeah, I do. We are being invaded by another player. That's gonna be interesting. Especially since I've spent all my Crystal Soul Spears, which are normally enough to kill a player in one hit. People don't tend to play sorcerers in PvP. But the real question is where the fuck he is. There he is. So, I'm gonna need to deal with this NPC first, because otherwise it's gonna be problems time. It looks like he's being honourable, which is nice. What's up? What are we doing? Are we cool? Oh, I think he wants to, like, fight properly. Oh, yeah, that's definitely what's happening. Oh, he backed me into that thing. That's... Cr that's... That's cringe, my dude. How dare you? How dare you bring an NPC into this fight? Looks like it might have been unintentional since he's not also attacking me. I do really like when uh, other players are willing to fight honourably, I have to be honest. Especially considering that as a, I'm kind of a sorcerer, which is kind of the most dishonourable imaginable way to fight. Anyway, this is what happens if you play sorcerer. Um, either you kill someone with Crystal Soul Spear in your first hit, or they will probably teleport behind you and backstab you. Uh, nothing personnel, kid. It's just like that. It is, um, not that difficult to kill people in PvP. The main problem I had here was simply that I was also fighting three shrubberies at the same time. 
If he'd attacked after I cleaned the area, cleaned the area out, I would have had a better chance of actually nailing him on the on the nose with a, a crystal soul spear. Um, my ordinary soul spear knocked most of his health off, so it would have been a problem. But uh, it is always nice. It is always nice to run up against a player who wants honourable combat. It's it's um, you know it's not mandatory by any means, but it does it does just kind of like warm the heart. That's interesting. I wonder why I did so much more damage. There is a um, Oh, the homing attacks are very useful, and I should have, straight up, like, in terms of meta, I should have cast that as soon as I saw him. I don't know why I forgot. I'm just bad at remembering. But yeah, uh, if I had cast that, it would have staggered him. So uh, he probably would have been able to he, been able to dodge the, the homing attack, or it would have hit him and staggered him. Either way... If I cast my spell at the same time as he was either dodging or being staggered, uh, my my crystal soul spear would have squarely smacked him in the face and killed him. The main reason I don't use them is that they're very useful against certain specific enemies, and um, I only have ten casts per rest, uh, and it's very easy to get them to to bump into scenery and be lost, uh, or they just di also disappear. Um, quite quickly time-wise as well. Now that's a fashion icon right there. A loincloth and the uh, the helmet of Zena. So this actually is very close to where we were, so I didn't need to go all the long way around after all. Um, but this forest... These guys are, these guys are members of a... Of a um, Covenant called the Forest Guardians. These are NPCs. There's, um, I think six NPCs here who are sort of modelled after player characters, and it's kind of supposed to be implied that uh, they are player characters. They are this. They are player characters who are just in this zone, because the kind of person that you are as a player character is a consistent thing within a, in, within the world. And these guys also are the are those guys, I guess. I think I'm being invaded again. I am being invaded again. So I might need to go through this area in uh, human mode, depending on how well I do. Actually, no, this is just an ordinary invasion. That's interesting. Let's see what happens this time. He'll probably switch to a lighter weapon. Or he'll just tank it on the face and not get take any damage somehow. I th Okay, this guy is definitely abusing something. So I hit him with two soul spears and with most of a volley from my uh, crystal soul orbs. None of which did any damage to him. There is no way he has enough magic resistance to take zero damage. So I'm not sure what he was abusing there, but it was definitely something. Uh, it's going to be boring if I come through here and get killed by, by other players constantly. So I'm going to go through as human, which uh, I don't normally like to do, but it's going to be bad radio if I just die over and over and over again. Interestingly, this guy has the same uh, range limit on his sorceries as I do, which was not true of some of the M sorcery NPCs we've seen previously. Yeah, a lot of people... Uh, I can't remember how you do it, but there's a way to like fuck up your ping so that it's like to your benefit. Um, that a lot of people use, which is often how you end up being backstabbed by someone who's in front of you. Now, where the hell did that knight go? As I said, there's about six of these NPCs running around here. We don't need to clear them out, but for the sake of completion, I like to. We've killed a sorcerer. We also fought the knight earlier, but I don't know where he's gone now. They respawn endlessly, which makes this... A, well, they respawn when you rest at a bonfire, which makes this a really useful soul farming location. Oh, there they are. There's the, uh, the warrior. The priest. And the uh, other guy. <laughs> the rogue, I think. The rogue's actually wearing a really interesting item, uh, which makes you almost invisible if you're more than a certain distance away from your opponent. So I think there's two or three more. 
So, um, the first guy who invaded us was a blue phantom. What that means is that he's a member of the covenant that protects this, that protects this area. Uh, members of that covenant are freely able to invade players who enter this area. The red phantom would have been a different player who was just a uh, in an invader who is invading for his own funsies. Anyway, this is the leader of the covenant. This is a quote cat unquote, regardless of regardless of this whole deal that she has going on. So if you join this covenant, even if you never do any invasion, it stops those NPCs from attacking you. It also uh, stops other players from that covenant from invading you, which means that I should actually be able to go rest. I didn't tell you there was a giant angry cat because I straight up forgot. It's kind of amusing that um, she tells you, don't go looking for Artorias. A, we protect this zone and you're not allowed here. B, don't go looking for Artorias. But if you if you join the Covenant to get through the area and not have to deal with her or her, her minions, uh, you can still just go fight the guy and get uh, get the stuff from Artorias' grave. Like, there's no penalty for that. It doesn't break your Covenant in any way. I can still use my soul magic, so I can use them as much as I like. Joining that covenant doesn't really affect anything. Um, and in fact, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave, uh, leave it on Forest Hunter for now. But um, I might switch it back to Way of White later. Oops! If I'm here, I might as well become human again. There is a cooldown timer, so I can't get invaded by uh, a random phantom again for a while. But yeah, um, joining Alvina on the way to going going to fight this boss is just, it's convenient. Um, it's absolutely paying lip service so that you can just get through without having to fight the guys every time you die. <laughs> See, we're, we're buddies now. We're good, we're good friends. We're all, we're all chill. We can take a closer look at this, this guy and his nice endearing mustache. That's reasonable facial hair. I trust this man. It's kind of tempting to backstab him, but we're not gonna we're not gonna <laughs> get ourselves thrown out of the covenant that fast. So, having joined the covenant, there's a new NPC over here, which is this guy. He's kind of in charge of of uh, of this covenant. That's about it. 
Don't worry. It's a good old time, isn't it? Great to have you with us. Uh, he's a merchant when you meet him somewhere else. I don't think he sells anything right now. Yeah. And he's also got this uh, sneaky assassin bodyguard who never says anything. If you go to Blight Town, you can run to these guys again. What they're doing there is a mystery. But um, I believe if you kill the ninja in that location, he drops a very useful ring. Which allows you to somersault instead of... Um, Oh look, here we have the archer NPC. So I'm just gonna sprint around trying to find the fucking like one item I've missed. Which, now that I think about it, is probably pointless. <laughs> um, Dark Root's big and uh, easy to get lost in and there's only a handful of items scattered around so let's not go crazy. I don't think there's anything back where we were previously. Oh, that reminds me. Oh, hey, here's the night. Um, that reminds me. There is actually a, um... When we were talking to Alvina, you can just about hear cat noises behind her speech. What Alvina is within the cosmology of this world is anyone's guess. I personally like to believe that she's a sort of a natural spirit. A sp either, either a spirit of nature as a concept across the board, or, you know, kind of the genius locus of, uh, this specific place. Which is why her whole deal is protecting these woods. So we can cross that bridge to go to that zone, or we can cross the other bridge to go to a sub zone, which I think is not accessible otherwise. But I might be wrong. Uh, oh god. Have you ever been to the forest and you just get. <laughs> You can't see the forest for getting stuck in the trees. The DLC area, Ulasil, is actually this area just with a reskin. Which is kind of interesting. Both of the DLCs to this game are recycled content. The Painted World of Arianis, of course, is- Oh, by the way, Julie, you might be disappointed here. I'm going to absolutely murder the fuck out of some giant cats. I think these are called feline beasts, technically. Um... They don't have tons of hit points, but they are very effective attackers. And there's three of them, I think. They have this bizarre attack animation. It's kind of amusing. That's one down, two to go. Running low on soul spears again, but that's fine. We're going to rest up before we actually try and fight the boss, of course. There's the next two. Let's see if I can aggro one. And get it to head a bit ahead. I think they're covered with porcupine quills as well, which is curious. have the same problem as the uh, skeleton wheels which is that if they hit you they'll just hit you and hit you and hit you well they have been defeated so that's fine they made a categorical error challenging me um right so i think there's a couple things to grab down here and then we have to sort of go back up and around again and then it will be time, it will be time, to, <laughs> having alienated half my audience by murdering three giant cats, it will be time to alienate the other half of my audience by fighting a dog. So I believe that, yeah, that is, that is the boss arena. Which means this upper area is the last place I have to go. So it's time to meet one of my favourite NPCs in the game, by which I mean enemies in the game. The Mushroom Children. Everyone loves the Mushroom Children. It is thanks to these guys that I have a deep and abiding love of ambulatory mushrooms in fantasy. <clears throat> Real mushrooms freak me the fuck out uh, for assorted brain reasons. However, you know, a nice toadstool like this, ambling around, maybe with a little 
shitty wooden spear. Just absolutely delightful. I love them so much. Those are the mushroom children. These are the mushroom parents. These ones aggro, the other ones don't. And these guys have some of the highest health pools, as you can see, um, and some of the highest damage on hit of any enemy in the game. If they, if they hit me, they will lay me out. So I have to be quite careful and make sure to keep circling and dodging. I believe they also don't stagger, basically, ever. There's a very popular um, gif of this game that involves someone doing the well, what is it emote in front of one of these, which is this. Just in time for it to land a square clock on his jaw, killing him in one hit. As I said, they'll lay me the fuck out. These uh, can actually also be found in um, Ash Lake. Much like... Um, oh, this is the Enchanted Ember. Maybe this is the one that lets you make enchanted weapons. Are there three tiers of magic weapons? Maybe there's... Uh, enchanted, big... Uh, sorry, magic, big magic and enchanted, maybe? So that's the main special unique item that we're going to pick up around here. The only thing left for us to do is to uh, figure out some way to get back to the bonfire and then come fight the boss. You read the book about fungi until it became food for the fungi. It's a shame I killed them though, because they're all pretty fun guys. But, you know, murdering mushroom people is the yeast of my sins. Ah, this is where we find the armor set of the uh, stone men that we fought earlier in, the, in uh, one of the connected areas near here. Which is very high magic resistance and generally a good set to have, but which we will never wear because we don't have the endurance for it. Oh, did that guy drop something? I didn't even realise. Ah, yeah, they're the only renewable source of gold pine resin. Uh, they, no, they're the only free source of gold pine resin. They drop... Uh, which enchants your weapon temporarily with lightning, which is very useful if you're fighting dragons and don't already have an enchanted weapon. I think there's actually a couple of weapons in the game that can be enchanted with temporary enchantments that already do have their own damage enhancements, which lets you do an absolute shit ton of bonus damage. So this is the other side of Alvina's little alcove. Hi, don't mind me, just passing through. I definitely didn't go check out the grave of Artorias, like you said. I'm definitely doing everything you tell me. Yeah, who's a pretty kitty? <coughs> So, um, yeah, I'm going to go head back and then fight the boss, then probably head back to New Londo and call it a night. Uh, my throat's getting a little bit sore, so I think I'm going to end this stream a bit early. But um, for, once again, for sorcerers, this is a very easy boss to fight. It's the saddest boss fight, but it is also not troublesome. Do we have enough to level up? We absolutely fucking do not. Do you have any more attunements either? I'm tempted to kind of put a couple more points in uh, intelligence and try and get dragon breath, but um, that's probably not the best place to put those points at this stage. Oh, really? You got stuck on the butterfly? The butterfly is literally like the, the second boss I fight in the game, usually. Or the third. It can be difficult if you if you can't get the dodge timing on his attacks and... Uh, but if you, summon, if you summon the witch, she basically wins the fight for you. Or if you have any ranged attacks at all, it's diff it's not that difficult to take down. Um, normally I would try and offer you some some advice about how to win the fight. But it's, it's s such an easy fight for me that I don't even know what advice I could offer beyond learn, learn to dodge. Um, which which is not really what I want to be saying. I do try to avoid the good, good paradigm, but... Um, is it paradigm? Paradigm? I don't know. But... Um, in this case, that's kind of it. 
But yeah, it's time to go fight the best boy. Time to go murder the... Actually, Sif's gender is never stated, so... But, I mean, all, all, all dogs are good boys, regardless of gender. <laughs> so, fun fact about this. There's actually a different cutscene if you've done the DLC, because you can meet Sif in the DLC, which was 300-odd years ago, uh, due to time travel shenanigans, and... Um, Sif has, has different animations. Sif indicates that it remembers you. And so this is the most beloved character in Dark Souls and the, the most the least wanted to be fought, and yet we're going to do it anyway. I love the iconography of this place. I love the Graveyard of Warriors. Artorias, the greatest warrior of history. And here, thousands of swords placed in honour of those who've fallen after him. I don't know if there's some kind of thing in Japanese folklore for dogs that wield swords in their mouths, but it does seem to be surprisingly common in video games. I shouldn't be able to name three games that involve a dog with a sword in its mouth. And I know there's more that I'm not remembering. So as a sorcerer, it's not very difficult to fight Sith. The same as, as a, same as the case if you're a pyromancer. You just... Blast away with your heaviest damage, and uh, yeah, see how much we chunked off his health bar, the poor thing? In fact, we can actually block most of his hits with our uh, our shield, which isn't a problem. So there it is, the quick kill. Absolutely re remorseless, me. I, you know, it's, it's a dog. <laughs> I, need, I need to come here. I got attacked by a dog. It's just what happens, isn't it? So, um, you know, don't complain to me about animal cruelty. Why don't you complain to me about sorcerer cruelty, huh? Nobody cares when, when it's sorcerers who get hurt. Nobody cares when it's sorcerers who get murdered repeatedly. I don't believe it is the same theme as the Abyss Watchers, but um, you never know. So I'm just going to Homeward Bone now, back to the bonfire. Or not, apparently. I should probably put these on my item bar, but I hate flicking through too many items in combat. Anyway, that is going to be all from us for today. I'm just going to do some leveling up, and then it will be time for me to go to bed. Except not. I'm just going to sit around and not go to bed instead. There, what do you think of that, huh? So yeah, um, if you're watching and you don't know already, I have in-depth Let's Plays on YouTube. I stream on Twitch Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7pm UK time. Thank you so much for watching. Please come again. I would love to have you come back. If you aren't already a, a follower, please follow. And uh, if you if you like my stuff, you can support me on Ko-fi or Patreon, or I even just share my channel with people, recommend me to people. I would really, really love to grow my audience, both on YouTube and here on Twitch. Thank you so much.